Hail and welcome. Paul here, once again. Now, in my last lecture, we talked about the turmoil of the late 10th and early 11th centuries, and that most inefficient monarch, Ethelred the Unready. We talked about his conflict with the Danes, which would lead to the St. Bryce's Day Massacre, where Princess Gunhild was murdered, and her brother, King Svein Forkbeard, would avenge his sister's death. How in 1013, Svein would drive Ethelred into exile, and how he took the English crown for himself. However, Svein's reign was very short-lived. He died within only a few months of ruling. But then his son Canute came into the picture. So let's start here by talking about Canute and Svein's ancestors. As I said in my last lecture, Svein was the son of Harold Bluetooth, who was the first Christian king of Denmark, and also considered the first king of all Denmark. But Harold's father, Gorm the Old, was also an important player. Gorm ruled from 936 to 958. Now, if Harold Bluetooth was the Athelstan of Denmark, then Gorm was its Alfred. Gorm was the one who really laid the groundwork for Denmark as a single kingdom, rather than a land of petty kingdoms. His son, Harold Bluetooth, finished his work, and is usually seen as the first true king of all Denmark. He was also the first to bring Christianity to that country. So in the mid-980s, his son Svein revolted against him, and then took the throne. And in the year 1000, Svein made an alliance with Norway that would give him control over most of that land. And then, as I said before, he went over to England to avenge the death of his sister Gunhild in the St. Rice's Day Massacre, and then he sent King Ethelred the Unready into exile in France. So Canute is from a very powerful line, and they already paved the way for him. They turned Denmark into not only a single union, but it was becoming more of a European superpower, and not just some heathen Viking barbarian land. Now, when Svein invaded England in 1013, supposedly Canute came with him. Also, one thing that is often disputed is if Svein's attack on England was purely out of revenge for his sister, or if it was some premeditated invasion of the country. It certainly seemed that, from the size of his army, his intention was not only to attack, but to conquer. After Svein died, Canute took the crown of England. Now, it is also important to note that after Svein left Denmark, it would be ruled by his other son, Harold II. Now, Canute and Harold's mother was a Wendish princess named Swetoslawa, the Wends being a tribe in modern-day Poland. Originally, you had two tribes there, the Poles in the east and the Wends in the West. Apparently, it was customary for the Danes to secure alliances and keep on good terms with the Slavic peoples of modern-day Poland, as they both shared the common enemy in the German king, the Holy Roman Emperor. Now, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle often glazes over Canute's reign, perhaps because they were a bit embarrassed that a half-Danish and half-Polish prince descended from Vikings 
came and conquered England. But what Canute did was pretty damn important. For one, I know I've loosely used the term King of England when describing Athelstan and his successors, and that term is used to describe Athelstan in Icelandic sagas too, but these kings actually all refer to themselves as King of the English. Canute was the first one to actually go by the title King of England. So by definition, yes. Athelstan was technically the first king of all England, but Canute was the first one to actually use the King of England title. Now by this time, the English had called for Ethelred the Unready to return from exile and to take his throne back. And alongside Ethelred was his son, Edmund who is known throughout history as Edmund Ironside. Well, the English agreed to put Ethelred back on the throne on the condition that he ruled more justly than before. He successfully drove Canute out and he sent him back to Denmark. However, Ethelred's court would see its own internal feuding. In Oxford, in the year 1015, a moot was called to secure peace between Ethelred and the two most powerful nobles in northeastern Mercia, Siegfirth and Morcar, who had accepted Danish overlordship. However, it turned out that the moot was a trap. The nobles were murdered by Ethelred's main advisor and elderman of Mercia, Eodric Streona, and thus Ethelred the Unready made yet another terrible decision. This was especially unwise of the Unready because he made an enemy in his own son, Edmund, who was a close friend to Siegfirth and Morcar. Edmund started a rebellion against his father, the king, and he married Siegfrith's widow, Ealdgith, who Ethelred attempted an order to seize. In doing this, Edmund established his power base in eastern Mercia and received submission from the folk of the five boroughs. However, by this time, Canute returned to England and started invading Wessex, this time with reinforcements, as he was aided by his brother, Harold II, King of Denmark, as well as a number of mercenaries, and he supposedly landed with 200 ships and 10,000 troops. And around this time, Ethelred fell sick, and the West Saxons slowly but surely began submitting to Canute. Even Ethelred's advisor, Edric, submitted to him with an army of Mercians that he had recruited whose original intent was to aid Ethelred. Edmund attempted to raise an army against Canute but was unsuccessful as the Saxons did not want to follow someone other than their king who was sick. He had better success raising an army the second time around, with the help of a Northumbrian Earl named Uhtred of Bebenburg. And if that name sounds familiar to you, it's because of the character Bernard Cornwell created in the Saxon Tales, the book series that the TV show The Last Kingdom is based on. Cornwell is a descendant of Uhtred, and when he made the character out of him, he decided to set him earlier, during the late 9th century, the time of Alfred the Great, when the Saxons were a bit more successful against the Vikings. Well, this real Uhtred was also known as Uhtred the Bold, and Edmund Ironside and Uhtred both 
ravaged their way through Andric's Mercian territories, but Uhtred then submitted to Canute after Canute invaded Northumbria, and then later was, he was killed by him. When spring came, the war shifted south towards London, where King Ethelred finally succumbed to his sickness and died on April 23rd, 1016, and Edmund was crowned king. Canute then invaded London, and following was a long series of squabbles and inconclusive battles, leading to two victories for Edmund at the battles of Brentwood and Otford. In time, Edmund's army would grow, and the two armies met for a final battle in Assendun, where Canute was victorious and his conquest of England could officially be considered a success. After the battle, Edmund was forced to sign a treaty where he would agree that he would only rule in Wessex, while the rest of England would be controlled by Canute. This was pretty much the former Danelaw regions. However, this time, those regions are ruled by a single monarch, and one who is more powerful than the West Saxon king. In the November of 1016, Edmund Ironside died, and it is highly speculated that this was an assassination. But it is also thought that he succumbed to the wounds he received in the battle. We are not sure, but what we do know is that this officially made Canute king of all England. And in time, he would establish himself as a proper English king rather than a Viking invader. He was active in protecting England against other Viking attacks, and in 1017, he married himself to Ethelred's widow, Emma of Normandy. He also elevated multiple earls to rule over what was really the four main Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. So now you have an Earl of Mercia, an Earl of East Anglia, and an Earl of Northumbria, all subservient to the King of England, with Canute and his household ruling in Wessex. One important noble in his household that is worth noting was a figure by the name of Godwin, who would have been Earl of Eastern Wessex by 1018 and then all of Wessex by 1020. Godwin, however, would become more important in my next lecture. Also, on a side note, ironically enough, the Earl he set up in East Anglia was Thorkill the Tall, the leader of the Yams Vikings, who had originally aided Ethelred against Canute's father, Svein. So now he has his father's former enemy on his side. So at this point, this Danish invader is already becoming more successful than any Anglo-Saxon king before him. In 1018, Canute's brother, the King of Denmark, Harold II, died, and Canute successfully gained the crown of that country too. So now he's king of both England and Denmark, and seemed to have had ruled both countries without any real problems. He appointed his brother-in-law, Jarl Ulf, to rule Denmark as a regent, also entrusting him with the care of his son by Queen Emma, Harthacanute. However, he also had his eye on the rest of Scandinavia, and the rest of Scandinavia had their eyes on him. His father, Svein, as I said before, had overlordship over parts of Norway, but not all of it, and eventually the Danes would lose their grip over those parts of Norway, and throughout the 1020s, the Norwegian king Olaf Haraldsson 
would take advantage of Knut's usual absence, and he began to launch attacks on Denmark, being aided by the Swedish king, Anand Jakob. And in 1026, Knut would crush Olaf and Anand with an army of Danes and Saxons at the Battle of Helga. After that, he would refer to himself as King of all England and Denmark, and the Norwegians and some of the Swedes, which we see in a letter that he sent in 1027. It was also around this time that Canute traveled to Rome to witness the coronation of the Holy Roman Emperor, Conrad II of Germany. This was a very important move of Canute for two reasons. One, the Germans were previously huge enemies to the Scandinavians, especially the Danish, with their attempts to conquer the heathens and force Christianity on them. Canute's forebears fought their share of fights against the Holy Roman Empire, but with Canute witnessing Emperor Conrad's coronation, he was pretty much making himself a very important ally. Secondly, this was Canute's way of showing the HRE that his empire is equal to it. During his reign, Western Europe had two important empires. The Holy Roman Empire, the empire of Germany and its dependencies in Italy, and Canute's Anglo-Scandinavian Empire, the North Sea Empire. Canute actually saw himself as being the Charlemagne of the North. After returning from Rome in 1028, Olaf attempted to once again rebel against Canute. In 1030, Canute was victorious over Olaf in the Battle of Stiklestad, but alas, his grip over Norway would wane over the years, as the representatives he set up there were not popular. He would lose the support of the Jarls of Trondheim, who were essential in giving him his power there, and the former Norwegian dynasty would be restored under Olaf's illegitimate son, Magnus the Good. Knut died of natural causes in the year 1035. He would be succeeded in Denmark by his son to Emma of Normandy, Hartha Knut, who would reign as Knut III. In England, he was succeeded by Harold Harefoot, his illegitimate son to his concubine, Eldgifu of Northampton. After Harold died in 1040, Hartha Knut would rule England for the two years before his death, briefly reuniting the two main countries in his father's empire. Queen Emma would be forced into exile to Flanders, being driven out by Knut's other illegitimate, illegitimate son, Svein. However, Emma's son to Ethelred the Unready, Edward, who was known throughout history as Edward the Confessor, would reclaim English rule in Wessex, but we will talk more about him next time. There is a famous legendary tale of Canute, where he brings his throne to the ocean and attempts to display his power by commanding the waves to halt. And of course he fails, nobody can do that. And really the moral of the story is that even the most powerful of kings is not all powerful. Now I'll read you a quote. With the greatest vigor he commanded that his chair should be set on the shore when the tide began to rise. And then he spoke to the rising sea, saying, You are part of my dominion, 
and the ground that I am seated upon is mine, nor has anyone disobeyed my orders with impunity. Therefore, I order you not to rise onto my land, nor to wet the clothes or body of your Lord. But the sea carried on rising as usual, without any reverence for his person, and soaked his feet and legs. Then he, moving away, said, All the inhabitants of the world should know that the power of kings is vain and trivial, and that none is worthy of the name king, but he whose command the heaven, earth, and sea obey by eternal laws. Canute's legacy is often overlooked by English historians, but it is certainly important. He brought a sense of unity to England that had never been seen, not under Athelstan, not under Alfred. In fact, he shares the same moniker as Alfred, being known throughout history as Canute the Great. He also created a lasting bond between England and Denmark, two traditional enemies, and he finished his forebearer's work in turning Denmark into a true European superpower. He also had a profound influence on the English military, founding the Order of the House Carls, an institution of full-time, professionally trained royal bodyguards. They would bring a Scandinavian influence to English warfare, most notably their use of the two-handed battle axe, or the Dane axe. And for a brief time, these house carls would be the backbone of England's military. Until the year 1066, when a more powerful foe arrived in Britain. But that is a story for next time. Bless to all.